other with little more than a few hundred meters between their respective front at Stalingrad, no man's land essentially did not exist, the distance between the opposing forces being measured in courtyards, corridors, walls and factory floors. The effect of this proximity was powerfully captured by one German officer of 24. Panzer Division We have fought for 15 days for a single house with mortars, grenades, machine guns and bayonets. Already by the third day 54 German corpses are strewn in the cellars, on the landings, and the staircases. The front is a corridor between burned-out rooms. It is the thin ceiling between two floors. Help comes from neighboring houses by fire escapes and chimneys. There is a ceaseless struggle from noon to night. From story to story, faces black with sweat, we bombed each other with grenades in the middle of explosions, clouds of dust and smoke. Ask any soldier what hand-to-hand -hand struggle means in such a fight. And imagine Stalingrad. Eighty days and eighty nights of hand-to-hand -hand struggle. It is in this context, of the close quarters warfare, that we sharpen our focus on two of the Stalingrad combatants, the German combat engineer and the Red Army rifleman, a story of the clash between highly trained specialists and battle-hardened generalists. The German combat engineers, collectively known as Pioneer, were a skilled fusion of assault troops and field technicians, organized in battalion-sized units within German infantry and panzer divisions. Injected more deliberately into the Battle of Stalingrad in November 1942, the Pioneer was seen as a fresh tip on the spear, one that could hopefully alter the balance in the close quarters fighting in Stalingrad against a frustratingly dogged Soviet defense. The training and capabilities of the combat engineers was both practically broad and militarily useful. They aided the flow of logistics under combat conditions by laying tracks, constructing improvised bridges and pontoons across rivers, and assisting water crossings with assault boats or inflatable craft. They would lay or build all manner of defensive arrangements, minefields, booby traps, tank obstacles, infantry bunkers, camouflaged supply routes, machine gun and mortar emplacements. On the attack, the pioneer truppen were also specialists in destroying enemy fortifications and defensive positions using flamethrowers, grenades, smoke and explosive charges, working in conjunction. It can appear rather sensationalist to rank battles according to the ever popular worst in history scale. Typically, the rankings are based on casualty counts and the sheer number of participants, human and mechanical. Using such a blunt metric ignores the fact that the intensity of action is not so easily measured, if we push the consideration down to the human level. A small unit action, for example, might last just three or four hours and produce only a few dozen casualties, but the brutality of the localized fighting during those hours could be extreme. Any armchair judgment about warfare must always be made from a position of humility, after all, and ranking battles purely according to sheer size runs the risk of treating individual participants as so much statistical data. This being said, 
The Battle of Stalingrad does have a justified claim to at least some privileged study in the history of warfare. Fought between August 1942 and early February 1943, the battle was indeed conducted on an apocalyptic scale, with an approximate casualty count of nearly 2 million men dead, wounded or captured. This statistic alone makes Stalingrad possibly the most costly clash in history, in terms of human attrition. It also ticks the box for strategic significance. The first great army-level defeat for German forces in World War II, Stalingrad marked the turning point in Hitler's fortunes. From February 1943 onwards, the overall trajectory of the war matched was retreat back to the homeland and eventual defeat. So, on the counts of both scale and impact, Stalingrad looms large over military history. And yet, these factors do not entirely account for the somber fascination with this clash on the Volga River. The terrible, defining element of Stalingrad was the unrelenting brutality of the fighting. Although the city was destroyed by heavy weaponry, it was the submachine gun sniping rifle, pistol, grenade, demolition charge, dagger and sharpened spade that frequently decided the fight within the city limits, backed by supporting armor and artillery. During World War II, opposing armies often faced each. A Soviet infantryman moves cautiously through the Stalingrad rubble, his seven. 62mm PPSH-41 SMG at the ready. Note how a sagging floor structure provides the soldier with overhead cover. Such obscuration was essential for any soldier in Stalingrad looking to avoid enemy snipers or fire from upper floors. 6. Don. Volga. Kuma. Explained in broad brush strokes, Operation Blue was Hitler's attempt both to force the Soviet forces to their knees in a final cataclysmic defeat, while also solving Germany's oil supply problems by capturing the oil fields of the Caucasus. The initial plan was for Hira's Grupsu to strike out from its front line east of Kursk and Kharkov, with two. Army, 4. Panzer Army, 6. Army, Hungarian 2nd Army, Italian 8th Army plus XXIX. Army are pushing down the Donetsk corridor towards Stalingrad. They would secure the northern flank of the operation on the Don River, while 1. Panzer Army and 17. Army drove down to the south against the Caucasian oil fields. Note that at this stage of planning, the oil fields were the primary objective, not the city of Stalingrad. This situation would change, however, as Hitler impatiently began modifying his plan following its launch on the 20th of June. The extent of the territory he as Grupper would have to occupy was enlarged, to reach far down the shores of the Caspian Sea. For here as Grupp B, the city of Stalingrad now became an actual objective, a distant, and, many would argue, unnecessary, focus. Furthermore, 
Here as Gruppi's ability to achieve this objective was hampered by Hitler's interference with the role of four. Panzer Army On the 17th of July, Hitler diverted this force to support Eras Gruppa in its push out of the Donetsk Basin across the Don around Rostov. It would continue the momentum of this drive deep into the Caucasus throughout the summer and into the winter of 1942. Thus 6. Army, under its new commander General der Panzer Trupp Friedrich von Paulus, with its Hungarian and Italian support, pushed on alone against tough opposition, crossing the Don Elbo and reaching the Volga to the north of Stalingrad by the 23rd of August. During those summer months, despite Hitler's interference, the two German army groups made good progress, pushing five Soviet fronts back in the process. On the Soviet side, Stalin reacted with his predictable combination of panic and ruthlessness as his bridgeheads on the Don progressively collapsed by mid-August. Stalingrad, the very name of which denotes Stalin's special psychological connection to the city, was to be protected by its own front, the Stalingrad Front, created on the 12th of July. On the 28th of July, he issued an infamous order commanding that our Stalingrad Soviet forces would take not one step back. In short, the Red Army would fight to the death for the city. As the German forces edged ever closer to Stalingrad, the Soviet military and civilian forces were mobilized in a massive effort to fortify the city digging endless kilometers of anti-tank trenches and creating chains of defensive positions. Back on the German side, the fortunes of Yeras Gruppi appeared to have improved on the 31st of July, when Hitler once again vacillated and reassigned four Panzer Army back to the drive on Stalingrad. On the 17th of August, Paulus's six Army crossed the Don and was advancing strongly on the Volga, forcing several Soviet armies back towards Stalingrad. German forces reached the Volga on the 23rd of August, the same day on which Luftflotte 4 unleashed a devastating bombing raid on the city, killing tens of thousands of civilians, yet ironically making the city more defensively obstinate by increasing the complexity of the terrain. Now Hitler made another fatal mistake. Instead of opting for isolating or bypassing Stalingrad, he sent his forces into the heart of the city to fight it out street by street. The core element of the Stalingrad defense would be the 62nd Army commanded by Lieutenant General Vasily Ivanovich Chikov. To the south was the 64th Army, under Lieutenant General Mikhail Stepanovich Yumilov. By November 1942, the Battle of Stalingrad already looked very different from anything that Hitler had conceived of earlier in the year. It had evolved, rather against original intentions, to become the focal point of Operation Blue, the ambitious offensive launched back in June 1942, rather than a sideshow, a fact that would spell disaster for the German Six Army and for Hitler's war plans generally. To understand the battles that followed, we need a sense of Stalingrad's layout. Stalingrad ran on a southwest axis a slender city about 18 kilometers long and mostly hugging the western bank of the Volga. The northern part of the city was the factory district, so called on account of its domination by several major industrial plants. This district was in itself divided into three sectors, from north to south, 
the tractor factory sector, focused upon the Zerzinski tractor factory, the barricade sector, and the Red October sector. Immediately south of Red October was the Mamev Kurgan sector, named after the dominant height there. The Mamev Kurgan itself was transformed into a heavily defended position by the Soviets, and for a time Chikov had his headquarters there, although it was captured and lost several times by the Germans. South of the Mamev Kurgan was basically the city center which alongside shops and houses included some important features, such as the central station and a major grain silo. Operation Blue, July, November 1942. 7. Don. Volga. Kuma. Volga. O-R-L-O-V-K-A. M O K R U M E C H at K A. Tsuretsu. 8. With German armor and infantry. They were also adept at blowing up virtually anything, from bridges and railway lines to factory buildings and machinery. As author Gordon Rotman states, the combat engineers were thought of as assault troops first and construction workers second. The Soviet rifleman was, by contrast, the product of highly variable training, but also, if he survived, intense and quickly acquired combat experience. Fused with the fierce motivation to fight that came from political threat and the willpower derived from defending home territory. By the time of the Battle of Stalingrad, the Soviets had absorbed losses on a scale that would have defeated most other nations. Yet with resilience, the Red Army reformed itself, and hard-won experience and new command relations led to a sharpened tactical understanding, such as the development of offensive storm units in urban warfare, better comprehension of how to create interlocked defensive positions, and a new competency in anti-tank warfare. As we shall see in the clashes between these two forces, several popular and prevalent myths about the Battle of Stalingrad are broken. The first is that the German forces were not suited to urban combat, but rather to the open maneuver warfare of blitzkrieg operations. This is simply not true. Not only the combat engineer, but also the regular German infantryman, proved himself a first-rate practitioner of urban fighting. What can be said is that the German forces were vulnerable to the attrition of urban fighting, and that city fighting was often not the best application of their tactical focus but such is not to say that they were not formidable opponents within the fabric of a town or city. The second myth is that the Soviet infantryman was scarcely trained cannon fodder, accomplishing through sheer manpower what he couldn't achieve through skill at arms. This is also untrue. Through the aforementioned experiences, among both soldiers and officers, and a steady improvement in tactics and some aspects of training, the Red Army soldier himself became a skilled practitioner of close quarters fighting. Indeed, it seems to have been a type of warfare at which the Soviets excelled. Given the martial prowess of the two sides, it was inevitable that the three actions studied here were brutal and unforgiving.